Welcome to the sixth annual Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understandings Innovation Exchange. <laughs> I know that's a mouthful to say. It was for me anyway. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you have been to one of our events before? All right, okay, cool. And so we wanna welcome friends of Saru and also folks new to our space. Um, I'll try to keep this introduction business brief as possible for people like myself who appreciate it when we just get to the main event. Um, so just to give you an uh, understanding of how this event's gonna go, um, I'm doing the open, opening remarks. My name is Asia Gray. I'm the Director of Fellowships at Saru. Uh, we'll hear some remarks from um, our Susio Kirpalani, um, as well as get straight into the panel. It'll be about an hour and a half, roughly. Um, and then we'll break into some uh, time for dialogue. There'll be time for dinner and for a sort of conversation during that time. Then last but not least, we have some wonderful breakout workshops that you'll hear more about. So stay tuned. Um, so just to give you more information about what Saru is, right? It's more than just a really long acronym. Um, we are the center uh, for of we're a center for diversity education that provides nonviolent communication tools to bridge social differences and to create a more equitable society. How many of you want a bit of more equity in your society? Yeah, me too. And so if that's something that's a perpetual interest of yours, continue to come out and see what we're all about and how you can plug yourself in. And so to that vein, um, we have two really important fellowships. And I'm not just saying this because I'm the director of fellowships. Um, our Undoing Bias Fellowship and our Social Organizing Fellowships are both opportunities for students to engage with issues of race, class, and gender, and to take action in order to make positive changes about having that equity that a couple of you raised your hands about wanting. And so, those are the things that we offer on a year-long basis. We also offer campus-wide um, workshops and uh, trainings for people to sort of understand how to engage in more nonviolent conversation and in really interrogate their own biases. And then last but not least, we offer events, much like the Innovation Exchange. Um, and the Innovation Exchange is one of our seminal events. It's part information, part discussion, and hopefully full of really interesting and important conversations about issues that are really impacting our world, like immigration. Um, and so during our six years of hosting this event, we always choose topics of critical concern. If you were here last year with us, we talked about Black Lives Matter and the movement for that in response to the fact that Eric Garner was killed um, as a result of police brutality. And this year, Along the same vein, we're choosing to talk about the changing climate and immigration because we know that conversations about the Muslim ban, about the executive orders are important not only to people in larger society, but for Queens College as one of, if not the most diverse college in the United States. And so um, we thank you all for coming out to really hear more about how to get involved in issues of immigration and diversity as well. So um, this year, we're so thrilled to have Shushil Kerpalani, a Queens College alumnus who had a broad range of things that he could have sponsored among the Ivies and other CUNYs and really chose to sponsor us. And so we thank you um, through his endowment. This will ensure we continue to have innovative, innovative spaces for dialogue on salient issues of our time at Queens College. Um, Sushil earned his law degree from Fordham in 1994. He's a partner and chairperson of the Bankruptcy and Restructuring Group at Quinn, Emanuel, Urquhart, and Sullivan LLP, a frequent lecturer on financial crisis litigation, distressed investing, and bankruptcy. Wow, things that I know very little about. Um, and so I would like to offer uh, Sushil the time to come up here and, and tell us a little bit more. Sushil. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. So um, I don't have any prepared remarks. I think it's much more important that you hear from the people um, who've got uh, the knowledge and experience about the topics that really matter to you. Um, I will just say that uh, philanthropy was not something that I really grew up with. Uh, my parents uh, didn't have very much. Uh, and obviously, I'm an immigrant or a Im child of an immigrant. Um, and uh, I did go to Queens College. It was, um, you know, not where I had 
growing when I was little thinking, oh, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to go to Queens College. Um, but it was the school that really gave me the opportunity um, to prove myself, to study, and then to move on in life um, at, a, at a price that I could afford. And I think that a lot of folks that go here have that same type of dream. Um, the only things I would tell you is, um, you know, I've been blessed with a lot of luck and a lot of success in my legal career. Um, uh, starting out was very, very hard for me. Um, not coming from a family of professionals, um, not coming from a family of people who really belonged um, on Wall Street um, and in Wall Street law firms. I thought it was pretty hard uh, to find my way around. Uh, I didn't have any um, relatives who were in the um, investment banking world or in big corporate America, and a lot of my colleagues were able to pick up clients just by calling relatives or people that they went to Princeton with or Harvard with, and I think for everybody that comes from more modest backgrounds, it's, it's just an uphill battle. Um, but I want you to all think uh, that anything is possible because it is, uh, and don't let people tell you you can't do something uh, because you can. Uh, and the one thing I would leave you with is if anybody ever offers to help you, um, you should take it. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have um, a lot of generosity from people who mentored me, uh, employers who gave me a chance. Um, I often thought that affirmative action played a role in my uh, getting to where I got. And uh, there was a day that I actually walked into the Fordham Law Review's office. Law Review is sort of like an honor society in law schools. Um, and I challenged the dean of the law school, um, who was also the advisor to the law review, that I want to know, how did I make it? How did I get onto law review? Because I never expected to even go to Fordham, let alone to do well. Um, and it was going to make my life. I knew it. And, uh, and she said to me, what are you talking about? Um, what do you mean, why or how did you get on? I said, well, I was reading the fine print in the law review policies, and it says right here that 5% you know, of the people um, that, that you reserve spaces or you could, you could make exceptions for people maybe who aren't that great and who come from you know, ethnic minorities, and I want to know, am I one of those people? And she said, first of all, I don't know. Second of all, if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. And third of all, get over it. Um, and, and it was harsh words um, from a woman that I, I respect immeasurably. Um, and it was the right advice for me. What she said to me that she meant by that is rather than question why you got to where you got to, do something with it, right? Don't throw it away. Do something with it. So I leave you with that. Um, and the last topic I wanted to um, mention to you, so I'm on the board of... Uh, Fordham University, the whole university, not the law school. Um, and it's a Jesuit, you know, in the interest of um, understanding of other religions, it's a Jesuit university. So I went to my very first board meeting, um, and I, I don't go to mass. I'm not Catholic. I'm Hindu. Um, and my parents were not really born in India. They were born in what's now Pakistan. And so it, I have a lot of different um, family experiences relating to, uh, to that. But uh, I sat there, and I listened to the priest. Uh, give a lecture to all the board members to pause and think about what we're doing here as board of trustees of Fordham University in the Bronx. And, um, and they showed this video, and I don't have it to show you, but you can visualize exactly what I'm talking about. It was basically a scene of New York City in the 1980s where everybody was crossing streets, honking horns, on a phone, um, and uh, you know, kind of running around and, and trying to avoid bumping into things and, and focus on their day. And then there was a freeze frame moment, and then the, this is very much a Jesuit practice, I understand, um, paused and said, I want you to go and reflect. Just go and reflect. I never did this, not part of my religion, um, to do that. Um, if we go and you know, sit in quiet, it's to take all the thoughts out of your mind, uh, not, to, not to just focus on what you watched in the video. Um, but so I did it. And I found a, a corner of the campus um, and sat there, I think it was the baseball field, um, for a while and then s try to see if some revelation came to me. And we went back um, and I, I think I was the only non-Christian person on the board, there's about 40 people on the board. Um, and they said, so what, what did you come to? You know, what, 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 what came, did anything come to any of you? And I was very proud. I said, yes, something did. Um, and they said, what was that? And I don't think it was a message they really liked, but they, they accepted it. And I said, well, what, what it made me think about is that, you know, the city of New York is such a, you know, a vibrant mix of different people, sounds, smells, distractions, things of that nature. And what, what everybody in New York does is we tolerate it. 
Like we go about our day, and if we're on the phone and you hear like some homeless couple arguing with each other and it's kind of getting distracting, you're like, huh, sorry, honey, what were you saying, right? And, and you just don't want to think about it. And if somebody's in front of you and they're walking and they're going kind of slow, you're like, oh, this is so annoying, and you want to go around. Um, and, and, but tolerating is not enough. Um, and it made me think of it tonight. Um, tolerating is not enough, and we have to do better. We have to be understanding. We have to walk in other people's shoes because we don't know what was happening with the homeless couple. Um, we all get into fights with our significant others. Um, we don't know um, what was wrong with the person walking in front of us, you know. And and rather than getting frustrated, and rather than just tolerating, I think if we can if we can walk in other shoes and think about it from their perspective, we'll all have a better life ahead of us. So that's it. With that, I, I leave you to the experts. Thanks. And thank you, Sushil. Um, so in addition to um, Sushil, we have some other really important sponsors that we couldn't have done this without you. Um, so please, if I call you or your organization, just wave a hand. Um, we'd like to thank um, the Taft Institute and um, Jack Zevin and Michael Krasner. Thank you. Um, we'd like to thank the Office of Student Life, um, specifically Dwayne Jones. Um, We'd like to thank the Michael Harrington Center, specifically uh, John Vogelsang. John was ready in the back, he knew. He's like, I'm next. Um, so um, without further ado, we're gonna get into our, our moderator for tonight, um, Sophia McGee. And what can I say about Sophia? She's the person who hired me, so I have a special place in, in my heart for her. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Saru's, yeah, it will, it'll do it. Um, Saru's fearless leader, um, she's the director of Saru. Um, she's created a space where we don't just talk about values of diversity and inclusion, we really try to embody them as an organization. We really, when we're talking about how we have better understandings, we have these conversations amongst ourselves and really try to put them into organizational practice. And you know, while a lot of nonprofits sort of have really admirable uh, values, I can't say that I've been a part of many that, that actually are putting a, a lot of those into practice. So um, yeah, I wanna, I have a lot of admiration on, for her. But um, as a leader, she's made bold moves to be responsive to the world, a world of uh, increased division, a world of increased aggression, and a world of, you know, to be quite frank, a lot of not listening. Um, and to create programming that really speaks directly to how can we listen to each other better so we can move into having more relationships and conversations and understanding. And so um, in addition to what she does as our director and fearless leader, she's also a lecturer, holds a master's degree in international affairs from the graduate program in international affairs at the New School. Um, her concentration is on conflict and security, and her regional area of specialization was the Middle East. Um, and so uh, she will be our moderator for tonight. And then one last and important point, which is this. Um, we are a diversity education center with a real concentration on nonviolent communication. I feel like I would be remiss without offering you some tips on actually how to do that. Um, the key to nonviolent communication isn't to hold hands and all of us sing kumbaya all together, right? That ain't gonna work. But to listen and not to turn away, even when things people say are hard to hear. To really be able and open up to the practice of listening to things that, you know, might be difficult or disruptive and, and hear that and then respond in a way that still appreciates and upholds the humanity of everybody in the space. And so what we're gonna have now is an opportunity for all of us to do that. We're hearing from our three speakers who are across the political landscape and we'll be offering a range of different uh, ideas and information on immigration. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring up Sophia McGee. Uh, thank you, Asia, and thank you, Sushil, too, um, for your beautiful words. Thank you very much. Um, there are a few other people here that I know. Oh, and here comes Jack Seven from the Taft Institute. Good entrance. We just called you. <laughs> okay. Um, a few other people that I need uh, to thank from the college who have always been incredible supporters of Saru. Um, the president, uh, Felix Matos Rodriguez, who is here. Um, thank you. And our provost, Betsy Hendry. Um, Vice, Pre uh, Vice President for Institutional Advancement, Lori Dorf, 
And Sarah Kahan, who is um, our liaison to the Queens College Foundation. Thank you. Um, also, Eva Fernandez, who is an assistant provost um, and is in charge of everything experiential, basically, here at Queens College, um, from fellowships, internships, the tech incubator to Saru. So she does all of it. Um, all right, a few more people I need to thank. As you, many of you may know, Saru is launching its Political Leaps of Faith project next semester, in which we will be bringing together students from across political lines in order to break down stereotypes and encourage trans-political collaboration. So on the Saru side, this is being facilitated by Yael Rosenstock and myself, um, but we quickly came to the realization that we couldn't do this by ourselves. Um, as two card-carrying Democrats, there's no truth in advertising there, right? Um, so we are joined in this endeavor by Joel Acevedo, who I think is here. There he is. Um, and also Pierre Benjamin, who I'm not uh, sure is here, but uh, you, will, you will see more about um, that in, in our program. Um, Joel is the New York City Chairman of the New York Federation of College Republicans. So I want to thank, I really want to thank both of them for being game enough to take this incredible leap of faith with you, Ellen and I, it is for all four of us as well as for all of the students. So thank you very much. And thanks for being here. Um, okay, thanks to the incredible staff at Saru, to Yael Rosenstock, who's our um, associate director, who's probably running around somewhere. Um, uh, yeah, she's outside. Uh, <laughs> to Asia Gray, who's our uh, director of fellowships. Um, Denise Pagano, who's our events coordinator, um, and also to the, the millions of um, interns and work-study students. I'm just going to go through them. Saichai, Marcia, Yana, Carmen, um, Sharon, Chrissy, Adrian, Leah, Darren, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but I'm sorry if I'm, if I, okay, I'm getting the thumbs up. Um, all of the people who did the million little things that, that made this possible. Um, so. The thing about our staff is that I don't think that I have enough words to express my gratitude um, for their passion and their persistence, their creativity, their brain power, and the positive outlook that every single one of them shows up to work with every single day. Um, they give 150% every single day in order for us to reach our goals and also to chase our aspirations, and often, on the evenings and in the weekends. Um, and so there really just isn't enough um, words to say thank you, but there you have it, thank you. Um, finally, thanks to all of you for being in this space with us. Uh, neither the innovation nor the exchange happens without every single one of you with your unique identities, your histories, experiences, beliefs, and passions. And all of you agreeing to show up and spend an evening here throwing out your collective energy at an issue that's of such extreme importance to all of us. Okay, so let's get started. Um, if you look in your program, you'll see that there's this little uh, insert, um, and on one side of it there are working agreements. Okay, I'm not gonna go through them, they're basically embodied in what Asia just said, but maybe take a look at them. These are the um, agreements that all of us use at Saru in order to keep the space safe, but also vibrant and slightly risky. If um, you know, we're being too safe, nothing happens either, right? We're just being um, safe with each other and we aren't actually having a conversation. Um, okay, index cards. I think that Yael has index cards in Asia that they will pass out and if you have questions, I know some of you have written them in already, um, but if you have questions, you can write them down and uh, they will be collected and um, I will ask them um, after we kind of do like an introductory round of questions with the panelists, so please feel free to do that. Um, I just want to make sure that both Asia and Yael heard me. <laughs> they might be running around. Okay. Um, yes, good. All right. So I want to, without further ado, um, introduce our three panelists. Um, closest to me, Brian Frumberg, who's the founder of Venture Out. Um, then Ali Procopio, University Program Director, director for Forward.us. And Francis Madi, Manager of Advocacy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you all for being here with us today tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take, um, I'm going to ask you each to take about five minutes to give us an introduction to who you are, 
um, what you do, and how the issue of immigration intersects with your work. Um, and perhaps along the way, maybe if you want to and feel comfortable, give us a little bit of personal narrative. Um, starting, I guess, um, all the way to my left here with uh, Francis. Thank you. And yeah, speak, speak into the mic so we can hear you. Thanks. Oh, is okay. that on? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Once again, um, my name is Frances Mali, and I'm actually also a, an alum from an alumnus from uh, Queens College, um, and also a former fellow at the Center for Ethnic and Racial and Religious Understanding. So I'm really happy to be back in on campus. Um, my position at the moment is as as a manager of advocacy for the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, mostly uh, working and organizing around our, cam our national campaign to pass a Clean Dream Act, which I'm sure some of you uh, may have heard, but if you haven't, we're gonna be talking about it uh, tonight as well. Um, uh, while I was on campus, I also um, worked with some of the undocumented uh, students that were attending um, the school at the time. Um, I myself am also undocumented and a DACA recipient. Um, and at the time, um, we didn't actually have the DACA program. And so um, our biggest organizing at the time was to push for a national legislation to pass um, immigration reform, to pass um, the DREAM Act, which five years later we're still fighting for. Um, and um, on campus, we wanted to create a space for undocumented students to meet, to organize, and to basically uh, get resources as well because, um, you know, accessing scholarships, financial aid, um, you know, mental health resources, all these things sometimes are missing uh, from, from this particular community. So um, we, were able to, we were able to also establish the Queens College Dream Team, which also exists here on campus today. Um, so hopefully we do have some undocu students in the crowd. You may have heard of it. Um, and uh, I applied for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, around the same time when he came out, a few months after. Um, I had literally graduated from Queens College two weeks when President Obama announced it on June 15, 2012. Um, and so it was a big surprise. Um, there were many, there has been many undocumented young people before myself that um, after graduating college didn't know what to do with their degrees because they didn't have the documentation to get um, a job where they could practice um, what they learned and what they studied. And so that was a huge, huge opportunity, not just for me, but for my entire community, just being able to um, pursue um, our dreams and plans in a way. Um, and so five years later, I'm now organizing in the immigrant rights movement. Um, this year, I also uh, took a break, just so you all know briefly, to focus on, um, since I've done theater and some uh, writing in the past, I wanted to be able to talk about immigration issues from an artistic perspective and to be able to reach more audiences through that uh, spectrum. And so um, intersectionally, because I know that was one of the questions, um, We've also been trying to um, talk about uh, immigration, but through different mediums. Um, we'll, I also have a podcast that I started recently where we talk about immigration issues in the state of New York. And so I, I want to encourage everyone in the room to, you know, if there's something that, that you're passionate about and you find a medium to do it, whether that's writing or that's uh, media um, or painting um, or even um, this stage, um, if you're an actor, uh, pursue it because those are sometimes some of the best ways to reach an audience and to start conversations. And that's why we're here to tonight as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Francis. Um, Ali. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so, like Sophia said, I'm the university program director at Forward US, which it's not spelled out like forward, but it's fwd.us because we're techie and millennial and cool. <laughs> um, so forward is a national bipartisan organization, and we focus on immigration reform and criminal justice reform. And so we are set up on the ground with teams in 32 states. Um, and I've been with forward for the past four years. I started out 
in Boston doing what most of our, my team does. Uh, the constituency that we try to bring to the table through Forward is the tech and business community and really getting them engaged in advocacy in a way that they really haven't been up until now. Um, and I've seen a lot of change in the past four years in the involvement of the tech community and immigration reform and not just for the parts of immigration reform that are gonna have a direct benefit to them and their industries, but they've also been really, really engaged in this fight uh, to protect DACA recipients, to protect dreamers, and to get a DREAM Act. Um, and so I kind of came to this work actually from my experience as a student. I took a lot of classes around immigration and the best thing about all of those classes is that the professors created the space for students to share their experiences with our immigration system. So that was the first time that I learned that I was at school with undocumented students. I had no idea. And that was also when I started to learn about the challenges that international students face, especially after they graduate and when they go to look for jobs and you know, face a lot of uh, pushback in, after interviews because companies just don't want to deal with the fact that they might eventually have to sponsor a visa. So that's kind of how I got to where I am and I'm excited to share more about me and about Forward later. Thank you. Thanks. Is that on? There you go. Hello. Hi everyone. Uh, my name's Brian Frumberg. Uh, I'll start by saying I've spent uh, most of the last six years working in tech and venture, uh, and which are both white male dominated, so it's awesome being the minority up here on this panel. Um, <laughs> so great job in, in, in selecting. Uh, I, I come to this from the perspective of somebody that works in tech. I run a startup uh, accelerator. Um, we, before I launched Venture Out, uh, I worked at a venture capital fund and had an opportunity to work with some really promising entrepreneurs, the kinds of people you see on, on Shark Tank, but the ones focused on tech, uh, that were from other countries. And I learned digging a little more about the challenges that these people faced in trying to build their businesses here. Right? So imagine running a startup in uh, Venezuela, for example, or in Mexico, or in the UK, or Israel, and trying to grow into the US because a lot of clients are here, uh, there's a lot of capital to be raised from investors like the fund I used to work with, and it's super hard for people to be able to do that. And it was even harder when I started doing this five, six years ago. And so uh, that didn't make sense to me because these people are coming here and they're creating jobs and they're creating opportunity and uh, are really contributing to the community here in, in a number of different ways, the kinds of ways that politicians are supposed to care about, right? Creating jobs, creating economic activity, GDP growth, and all of that. And, uh, and so I decided to start a company that would focus on finding the most promising entrepreneurs outside of this country and to help create a bridge to make it easier for them to get here and to succeed here because their success means success for uh, for the United States, for Americans that they will hire, for the people that will work in at, at other businesses because their innovation uh, affects not just them and their, their business, but a larger sector. And so uh, that was how, that was sort of my entrance into caring about uh, immigration because I was too naive before that to know that it mattered. And, uh, and the way I got into it was actually like a very selfish one. So. I had, uh, I wanted to host an awesome event to launch my company. And, uh, and I realized after trying to figure out why I would get people to care about me or my company that no one had ever heard of, um, I decided, I realized that immigration was really critical to what I wanted to do. If there's no path, if there's no actual visa vehicle for uh, entrepreneurs from other countries to get here, then I had no business. And so, uh, and I, and I learned quickly that immigration reform was something that a lot of people cared about. And so I, my, our launch event was about the intersection of immigration and entrepreneurship and how it affect the economy here in the United States. And by doing so, I was able to get people who didn't care at all about me to care about this event that I was organizing uh, and, uh, and, and could sort of like ride the coattails of this movement. Uh, through doing that, I learned about how, about the problems that our broken immigration system have really caused, not just for uh, people from other countries that are trying to get here, but for the people here um, and the impacts that it has on us and our economy and our culture. 
and, uh, and, and it became an issue that I cared a lot about, and so it became something that I spoke regularly about, and it was really awesome about five years ago when Forward also opened up an office here in New York City, because they were founded by Mark Zuckerberg out in San Francisco, uh, and, and opened an office about five years ago, and we started co-organizing events together, uh, and I've been heavily involved with, uh, with Forward uh, since. And so they started an innovation council here in New York City, uh, of which I'm a founding member of, um, and we are constantly uh, supporting the flow of immigrant entrepreneurs, you know, over 200 coming through programs that we organize every single year. And so that's uh, a little bit about me and what we do and why and like how inter immigration intersects with, uh, with, with my life. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, so now to a bit of a deeper dive. Um, Ali. Okay, so this is going to be the Reader's <laughs> Digest of a lot of, of, of a lot of these issues that are, that are very important, um, and we'll try to unpack them a bit more like as we go along, but here you go. Here's your Herculean um, <laughs> task. Can you give us a brief rundown of legislation that is currently in the House and Senate? Um, you know, we're talking about bipartisan immigration reform. What's out there that we should know about? Um, are there any, what are the kind of differences? Like, what are people kind of stumbling over? And, you know, briefly, I don't, yeah. Not a whole, you don't have to give us a whole lecture. <laughs> I'm up for the challenge. Excellent. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because unless you're a super policy wonk that really loves this stuff, it doesn't make sense for the average person to know about it. And I work in politics, and I don't even want to know. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Francis explained a little bit about DACA. But how many of you are familiar with the DACA program? Cool. Quite a few of you. That's awesome. So. When we're talking about legislation that's been introduced so far, we're talking about legislation that's going to be a, a fix to the DACA program, which was taken away. Um, so basically what happened with DACA is that it was a program that was implemented that allows undocumented folks who are, came to the U.S. when they were children. They had to come under the age of 16. They had to be in the U.S. for a certain amount of time. They had to pass a background check. Every DACA recipient um, gets a background check, has to get their biometrics done. And so then all of these young people who were able to be part of the program, which ended up being around 800,000 people, were able to stay in the U.S. with the ability to work and be deferred from deportation. So they would, didn't have the threat of deportation hanging over their heads. They were able to go out, get jobs, contribute to their communities. Um, and so in, on September 5th, that program was taken away for a variety of reasons that I don't think we need to get into. Um, and so now the, the situation that we're in and the kind of task that's before Congress is to come up with a permanent legislative solution that's not going to pull the rug out from under those 800,000 people who were enrolled in the DACA program, right? Because they, I mean, folks in the immigrant movement, especially undocumented people, talk about coming out of the shadows, and the DACA program really allowed a lot of these young people to do that. Um, and so now they're fully integrated in our society. They're at schools. DACA allowed a lot of people to um, be able to afford school because they became eligible for in-state tuition. Um, they're also part of so many companies across the country. Um, this Today, actually, we flew in a bunch of DACA recipients who are employees with their employers to DC to talk about just like how much a, a part of, our, of these companies they've become and how much um, we'll be lacking if we don't pass a legislative solution that allow them to continue the work that they're doing. Um, so there are quite a few bills that have been introduced so far. There are three in the House, two in the Senate. Um, and I think that the two biggest takeaways thinking about this is, one, the fact that there have been so many proposed solutions is great and shows that Congress is paying attention and knows this is something that needs to be fixed and needs to be fixed now. Um, and also that there's bipartisan support, right? So um, a lot of these bills themselves have bipartisan support and there are bills that have also been led by Republicans. And d Democrats and Republicans have really come together to recognize that not only do they want a solution to this problem, but they want it to be permanent and they want their, it to include a pathway to citizenship for these people who are part of the DACA program. Um, so have many, how many of you have heard of the DREAM Act? Okay, and how about the ROC Act? Okay, I didn't think so. So those are the two that people have kind of converged around the most. Um, they're very similar and they, um, most of what they entail is very similar to what people had to go through to enroll in DACA. So they still had, have to be in the U.S. for a certain amount of time. Um, they have to pass a background check. 
um, and they need to kind of choose a pathway that's going to help them earn citizenship. So that can be going to school, um, getting a high school diploma or GED, it can be higher education, it can be enrolling in the military, or it can be having a job. Um, and so the real differences between these two bills that people have sort of come together around um, is the number of people that they would impact and the amount of time it takes people to become a citizen. So um, people have advocates, uh, NYIC, most people have converged around the DREAM Act because that's a piece of legislation that would impact the most number of people um, and provide the most reasonable sort of pathway. Is there anything else I should elaborate on? No, can you tell us what DACA stands for, though? DACA, yes. DACA stands for Deferred Action. Am I getting involved? I'm not sure. Is I that you? Know. Okay. <laughs> DACA stands for uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And what about, so one piece of the legislation you said was? The RAC Act. Yes. Um, and that stands for Recognizing America's Children. Okay. Yeah. And Great. DREAM also stands for something, but to be honest, I don't remember. <laughs> It's yeah, kind it's of like Saru, it's really long. Yes, you, can, you can forget about, right, the actual. Um, excellent. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Francis, can you talk, you, you're, you know, the person who kind of has been on the ground here in New York, um, you know, in this past year. Uh, can you talk about the various executive orders or other developments of the year and what they translated to specifically on the ground? Um, Spe you know, so I guess your work with the New York Immigration Coalition, how did you organize around specific events? Yeah, so um, just I didn't get to uh, mention what the New York Immigration Coalition does, but we are a state organization um, that's composed of over 150 members, 170 members all over the state of New York, and we work on policy, on advocacy, on behalf of immigrants. Um, my work specifically, uh, previously, uh, before I took this new position, was to work with our member organizations around the state on legislations that would um, benefit immigrants, such as more legal services or English classes, not just in New York City, but also like in areas outside of, of, of the city, uh, which are usually missing the most resources. Uh, in my new... Um, uh, capacity. I'm going to focus, as I mentioned earlier, on the New York, uh, not the New York State Dream Act, the federal legislation, the uh, Dream Act. Um, and because, as Ali mentioned, it is the legislation that offers the most relief, not just to DACA recipients, but tho those of us, those in the community that uh, weren't um, eligible for DACA, um, we are supporting that legislation. Um, and so this year has actually been incredibly uh, impactful, not just for our organization, but I think for um, all of the advocates that are working on immigrant rights issues because uh, we have gone from advocating on particular legislations or um, you know, defending the, com the communities to uh, being ready to respond right away given um, the type of, of administration that we have um, now. So for example, and the first example that I can give you is actually in January, uh, right after uh, the president took over. Um, I think a week later, um, he announced the first uh, Muslim ban. And um, as soon as he um, announced it, uh, we were on the ground uh, in JFK, um, talking, bringing in lawyers, bringing in um, Congress members. Uh, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez was there. Um, she's from Brooklyn. Um, making sure that uh, people weren't actually being banned from entering the country. Um, the excuse of the government at the time was that they were trying to protect us, but there were so many refugees and many different uh, people that actually even had um, residency in this country that all of a sudden weren't allowed to enter. And so this actually sent people into uh, a huge uh, wave of solidarity and the action in JFK turned into uh, you know, thousands of people coming out that night. I believe between two and 3,000 people uh, were on Terminal 4 that night. Um, and I believe that that particular action sparked um, sort of like the movement that has happened throughout the year um, with the, um, the, the responses that we have, the quick responses that we have to, 
to whenever something uh, that comes from the administration is announced uh, and what we do about it. Uh, on September 5th, um, the administration also announced uh, the termination of the DACA program. Um, and they also did it on a Friday night when uh, you know most people are already getting ready to go home. Um, and I believe that was Labor Weekend too. And so that sent everyone into uh, <laughs> a weekend, a weekend-long organizing um, event. Uh, people coming out uh, to rally with us in the streets. Thousands of people as, as well. Um, throughout the year, however, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, the, the Trump administration didn't just stop at the first Muslim ban. Once uh, we got the courts to to stop it, um, they continued to uh, make sure that they could find other ways to to stop the entrance. Um, of folks that were coming from six particular countries um, in the Middle East. And um, a, a second Muslim ban was uh, launched as well. And that was a stop in June of this year. Um, and a decision on, on these ban was finally made actually two weeks ago by the Supreme Court, uh, where they basically stated that um, the decision made by the lower courts uh, stands. And, um, uh, if you have uh, family members in the U.S. Um, or any sort of business um, here with the United States of, of America, you are allowed to enter regardless of your citizenship. And so clearly uh, this is not over for the administration. Um, and uh, we continue to fight for um, not just uh, Muslim immigrants and, and refugees, which as you may know, um, Many of them reside in the northern parts of the state, um, but also for um, DACA recipients and DREAMers who are also now on the verge of losing their work permits. Um, just so you know, uh, on March 5th next year, um, a, a, a 1,100 uh, DACA recipients are going to start losing their work permits every day after that. Um, if the uh, if Congress or the Trump administration doesn't do something to pass a legislation. Uh, my, my work permit actually expires in January 2019. So that means that I have about a year for uh, Congress to actually do something about it. But that's just me, like every DACA recipient has a different um, deadline that um, they have to, um, that it's gonna end. And um, you know, it's not just um, the DACA recipients that are gonna be affected, it's also like, as you, you're going to hear from them, it's the businesses that are also going to be affected. It's the family members that are going to be uh, broken apart. And so uh, what we need to do is to stop, create, stop separating the communities and stop criminalizing the community and actually sit down and, and offer a relief that is actually going to bring the, this entire community um, out of the shadows and into the, the, the threat of this um, country. Getting back to Brian, I think you touched a little bit in, in your opening statement about um, why the issue of immigration is so important in the tech industry. I think you gave us a really, you know, I think a very good idea. Um, so I guess I'll just ask the follow-up question, which is, um, so then what is the connection um, to forward.us, fwd.us? Sorry, I am not a millennial. You can say um, forward. <laughs> and uh, also the, the Innovation Council. Um, can you talk a little bit more about you know, why that was created and, and what it does? Uh, sure. So you know, I think it's important for people to know that can you, Oops. is this working? Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Great. Um, it's not only tech that is impacted by immigration, it's really the entire economy. And that's not, it's, it's for, you know, some of the reasons that we're touching on before, which are, you know, there are 800,000 DACA recipients that are working in dozens and dozens of industries all, uh, all around the country, uh, but also because tech influences every industry that exists now. Uh, New York, in comparison to like Silicon Valley, is known as a, a hyphen tech town. Uh, and what they mean by that is it's not just tech, it's FinTech or financial services tech, it's uh, ed tech, which is education tech, it's uh, health tech, biotech, med tech, fashion tech, it's all the different industries that are, uh, and, and not just here in New York, of which there are dozens, but, uh, but all across the country, uh, where tech is sort of innovating in, uh, in, a, in a legacy space. Um, and, and entrepreneurship and innovation is also not just uh, technology. Um, and, and the reason that matters is because when you look at the actual statistics related to 
uh, to immigrants coming into this country, people born uh, so to parents of immigrants, their instance of entrepreneurship, so going out and actually starting a company, is like five or six times what it is in a Native American citizen. Um, the, and, and separate from uh, immigrants coming into the country that actually are creating companies that are then directly employing people, um, when, when you do the math on immigration, period, it's like for every immigrant that comes into the country, more than one job ends up being created in the United States because of the impact that they have on the economy. Um, and so, uh, so it, it really matters to everyone uh, that cares about the economy, that cares about w wanting to have a job. And what has been really frustrating for me, and to out myself, um, you know, most of the people in the organizations that I work with, whether it's Forward uh, or it's the New York City Innovation Collective uh, and, and some others, uh, it, they're mostly uh, like liberally based organizations where pretty much like everybody is a Democrat. I'm not. I'm a registered Republican. I'm a very socially liberal, uh, fiscally conservative uh, registered Republican that's voted for both Democrats and uh, and Republicans in office. Um, I'm often the one touted out to go and talk to Republican members of Congress, given I'm one of their constituents. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a bipartisan issue. And, and, and forward, it, it also has a number of, of, of Republicans on it as well, uh, because this is not uh, a partisan issue. Right, like the economy, job creation is not a partisan issue. And for me, what's been really frustrating about a lot of the policies that have come out uh, under this new administration is from my perspective, from the facts that I know, uh, they don't seem to be actually working to achieve the ends which they are promising the people that it will. And so what I mean by that is, the thing that kept me a little, like getting here a little bit late is a newsletter I was working on writing uh, earlier today. Uh, we could just use the one mic. Yeah, better. maybe. So sorry about that. Yeah, maybe um, I'll just use that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Don't worry about it. Better? Much better. Much. All right. Thank you. Uh, so where was I? Oh, yeah. So I was writing a newsletter. So um, obviously immigration matters to my job. It matters to organizations I'm, uh, I'm a member of and a leader in. Uh, it also matters to me personally because I've gotten really... Uh, just sucked into this entire issue because of, of like the emotional side, the personal side, the social side, but also the business and economic side. And, and speaking to that and, and to specific policies, what I was writing about today, and I've written about the DREAM Act, I've written about uh, Startup Visa Act, which has come out. I mean, my launch event was around an, an the, start, the, f the second Startup Visa Act, and that was in 2012. So it's been, it's been a long journey. Uh, the last one was about restrictions that are now placed on H-1B. And the reason that, that these restrictions that were passed down from the White House to the USCIS, which is the Citizenship and Immigration Service, uh, is to restrict the renewal of H-1Bs for people that have already been approved. And the reason that they give is because they want the jobs that these people holding an H-1B visa uh, to go to Americans, right? Which sounds great. It's like, oh, okay, so these other people aren't going to get the jobs. More Americans are going to be employed and greater employment for the U.S., and that's better and, like, rah, rah, Trump. The, the problem with that is that, especially if you're looking at it's the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math, there are three million unfilled jobs in the United States in those fields. And there, for every job... Uh, for every unemployed person with a degree and the training required to take one of those jobs, there are 13 open jobs, right? So there are not, if you employed every American, if you were able to connect everybody in the country that had the skills to fill those jobs with the jobs available, for every one, there are another 12 people, there are another 12 open positions that we just can't fill with the people that are here. And so when you don't have American workers to fill the jobs, the companies like mine or uh, you know, Liz uh, is another uh, DACA recipient who works for, for uh, you know, I'm totally on Samsung uh, and their venture capital arm. Uh, and for others, you have to go someplace else. You have to hire non-Americans. And that's a lot of the purpose of the H-1B program. And so now you have all these employers that want to hire people with specific degrees in science, technology, engineering, or math that can't 
there literally is no one for them to hire because this restriction has been put on an H-1B program. And so these people that were coming from other countries here to help those companies build, to help them grow, to help them innovate. And if they do grow, they create more jobs for Americans here. Now those companies won't be able to do that. And so this policy that was touted as something that would actually create more opportunity for Americans to have jobs is actually starving those companies of their ability to grow because they can't, there is no one here actually for them to hire in those positions, which means the companies are no longer going to grow at the pace that they would be able to otherwise. And they're not going to be able to compete with the other companies in their industry, in their space that are from other countries that have no problem hiring people from other places to come and take those jobs. And, you, and, and so it's actually decreasing the number of jobs for Americans instead of increasing it. And this idea of a competition for talent is a really important one that, is, that underlies for the business side, for the e e economic argument, um, it, un it underlies that because uh, we want American companies to build and grow and to be able to compete against their uh, counterparts abroad. And, and what you have is we're actually not competing. We're actually making it harder. And so we are less competitive and we are growing more slowly, which is the exact opposite of what anybody would ever want for this country. And then the flip side of that is you have places like the United Kingdom and Canada and Australia and others that are saying, can't make it here, like can't make it in, in, in New York, can't make it in San Francisco, can't make it in the US, come to my country, we will give you a job, we will give you tax credits, we will literally stamp a visa to your, uh, to your application for fundraising, is what they do in Canada, like please come. They are actually competing to get the best talent from all around the world to come to where they are, because that's the only way that you compete. You talk to you know, a company like a Google, which everyone knows, like they, the, what makes them better than anyone else doing the same thing that they do are the people that work for them. And so, they, and they are not just looking for the best people in San Francisco or Silicon Valley or any place else in the US that they have an office, they're looking for those people globally because they want the top like 0.0001% of the people uh, that are working in their space. And they compete aggressively for that. And the challenge like, and the frustration as someone who works in that space is that we're not competing here in America, we're actually handcuffing ourselves by the policies that we have. And what's even more frustrating about that is that it is not, this is not a new issue. This is not just a Trump issue, although it's getting way worse. It is actually an issue that dates back to the 80s, which is the last time we've actually passed any laws to improve our immigration system. And so this is a legacy issue. This was a huge problem in 2012 when I launched the business that I'm in, and the, and the problem is only growing. And so, so again, it's not just about tech, it's, it's, it's about the entire economy, it's about every industry. Uh, to, like, I've gone on for a while. So uh, to great. just answer the, the one piece about uh, the Innovation Council. So the Innovation Council is just a way to pull people from different industries, from, uh, from tech and beyond tech to get involved uh, because we want other people in our ecosystems, in our communities to be getting involved with immigration reform, with supporting things like the DREAM Act because it matters. It doesn't just matter to us and, and, and our communities. It doesn't just matter for social and emotional reasons. It matters for economic reasons. It matters. It matters. And it matters as Americans, uh, right? Like I am not an immigrant, but I am an American. So I am the relative of an immigrant, right? Like my heritage is an immigrant story. Uh, and so, anyway. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad uh, you brought up IRCA, which, is, which was the last kind of general um, you know, immigration, I guess, reform in, in the 1980s under Reagan. We have a really interesting project when we do the walkabout that you can look out here um, that is looking for stories of, of people who entered um, and stayed in the country um, because of IRCA. Um, and so that's, that was, is something that you can check out. Um, all right, so we're going to go to um, questions. Um, okay, it's taken me a couple minutes to read these. I'll start with ones that I have read. Um, and yes, please, this, this, this is the part where you get your voice in here. So write your questions down and, and pass them to Yael or to Asia. Don't um, be shy. Don't be shy, don't. Um, okay, so here is the first one, uh, and I think this can be to any panelist um, who wants to take it. Would you agree or disagree that the ending of DACA was beneficial because it politically puts pressure on Congress to solidify DACA, being that DACA was going to be 
challenged in the courts, sorry, I'm having a hard, um, on the basis the executive branch can't create law? Good question. That's yes. a big question. That's a, that's a multi-part question. I have some stuff to say. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, surprisingly, when DACA ended on September 5th, like many of us were disappointed, but we were not surprised because we knew the moment that he got elected uh, around this time last year, um, November 8, that um, DACA was going to end. It was just a matter of when it was going to happen. And so my one of my first thoughts when this happened was that, um, well, now the pressure is on Congress to actually do something about it because we spent the past, you know, almost five years fighting with Congress and like pushing for like permanent legislation. DACA is not a permanent solution. DACA just provided a two-year work permit and it didn't allow any pathway to citizenship or any pathway to uh, residency. And so for us it was like, well, at least for myself, um, it, I, I felt like finally Congress has to do something about it and they have to because every day they're hearing from their constituents all over the country that they need to do something to protect DACA recipients. My biggest fear is that they're, they're going to maybe come out with a legislation that will just protect DACA recipients and there are many, many people that were left out of the DACA program because for many different reasons they couldn't, um, they just weren't eligible. And so I really hope that they do the right thing by uh, passing a, le a legislation like the DREAM Act that will actually include a, a much bigger uh, community. As they mentioned, um, DACA just covers 800,000 um, young people. Um, and there's many, many more that were left out of. And as we're talking about our parents and the entire undocumented community, that's about 11 million in this country. And so 800,000 people, it's not enough. Um, and especially if it's just a temporary solution. We pushed President Obama to do something, and now we're pushing the Trump administration to do it. So when they finally did it, you know, I said, surprisingly, one of the first tweets that, that um, came out from, the, from President Trump was that, well, now it, you know, I washed my hands, now it's up to Congress to do something about it. Um, which in a way was like, well, that's not fair because, you know, we knew that this was just politically motivated from your part. You made a promise while you were running uh, to end it. So you kept that promise and that's going to score you some political points. But, you know, as a DACA recipient myself, I actually found myself weirdly agreeing with him. Like, yeah, you need to do something because Congress is the body in government that can actually legislate uh, permanent solutions and not um, um, the executive orders that are usually uh, just temporary. Um, I want to add a couple of things. So one, just want to say that DACA actually was, I don't think it was going to be challenged in the court. It had already like gone through that process and had been proven to be an okay. And it also was not legislation that was created. It was what is called prosecutorial discretion, which is the president can decide how he wants to use the resources that he has, including resources from the Department of Homeland Security. So he just allocated those resources towards um, other immigration enforcement that did not include those 800,000 people that were eligible for DACA. That said, the DACA program was not sustainable. Um, and something that we haven't mentioned yet is it was, you had to renew every two years, but you also had to pay almost $500 to renew every two years. And can you imagine having to do that? Like for, as an individual, as someone who's like trying to make their way through college, like every two years having to set aside $500 to make sure that you can stay in school and like stay in this country, that's absurd. Um, and lastly, I would say that yes, Congress does have the, have the opportunity to act, and we've talked about March 5th being the deadline that the program will finally end and there will be no more renewals, and after that, um, people's DACA is going to start lapsing and they'll fall out of status, but people have already fallen out of status. So the urgency to act is not just before March 5th, it's really before the end of the year. Um, I think there are over a thousand people that have already fallen out of status, um, and it's just going to continue happening. Uh, so that's something that I really want to emphasize, and something that that we can have a hand in putting pressure on Congress to do, right? They have, they have a deadline um, where they have to pass um, funding for the government on December 8th, and we can make sure that they include the DREAM Act, DREAM Act provisions in that, or that they take care of it beforehand. Um, and really, they sh no member of Congress should be going home for the holidays without making sure that this issue is taken care of. I'll add a final point. Um, uh,
and maybe try to speak through one of my fellow panelists. So, yes, executive actions are not meant to be permanent, right? There was a problem that Obama solve, saw that he, he tried to solve with an impermanent solution, but the, the Congress, right, law has to be passed for this to be fixed long term. The argument, the question is, was ending the DREAM Act, was ending DACA something that was good because it positively motivated action in Congress for this to actually happen? And while I may agree through my gritted teeth that there is more action and energy now because of, uh, because of what was done, because of that being repealed, it is really, really terrible to use children as a political football. And what I mean by that is the reason there is action now is because there are 800,000 children in the country that were brought here at an age when they were unable to understand where, like, what was happening, right? Those are the only people that were eligible for DACA. And, uh, and to put them in this place of limbo, right, of pending deportation, people that are contributing to the economy, people that uh, decided to step up and sign a list and give their fingerprints and write down their address and say, this is where you can find me now. Thank you for allowing me two years of work permit. And then ripped all of that away from them so that they are operating under the fear that now this list that they're on is actually a deportation list, as opposed to a now you can work here and contribute to the economy list. And, and, and to use that fear to drive a political issue is just a terrible thing to do. And so while it may drive some action, to put children in the middle of this, like to politicize these children in this way is, is, is it's, it's really deplorable and, and depressing for me. So I hope something positive comes out of it, but it's, it's really, really unfair. Can I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, to, just to add to what you just said, because I'm a DACA recipient, I mean, I'm not technically a child. I'm actually closer to my 30s than I am to being considered a child in this country, but there's many other DAC recipients who are actually in their mid-30s right now and who have been in this country their entire lives. And so it's crazy to think that there's, there, there are human beings that are, are still living in the shadows or that have a temporary work permit and we still haven't found a solution for them to actually become citizens and feel like they're part of, of, of society in a way. And so. You know, let's we can think about children, but let's also consider the fact that there's there are adults who are also um, part of the program and are still in limbo. Great, thank you. Okay, you've asked a bunch of really great questions, so I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, some of them are somewhat provocative. Um, <laughs> that is what it is. Okay. So this one is very straightforward. What can we do as students to help with the immigration <laughs> problem? And I can see Ali grabbing the mic because that's her job. That's my favorite question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking whoever asked. Um, so there's a lot that you can do as students, actually. Um, you have a lot of power because you're at institutions of learning. So not only can you, are you yourselves constituents and can you contact your members of Congress, which everyone should be doing. There was a flyer on the tables when you all came in that I hope you picked up that says dreamers.forward.us. If you go there, it makes it really easy for you to call your member of Congress. Um, so you can do that as a constituent, but you can also leverage um, the folks who are here with you at your universities. You can work with your professors. You can build coalitions of allies and um, undocumented students to make sure that students feel safe on campus and that they have the resources that they need. And you can meet with their members of Congress too. Like that's what they're here for. Um, and if you need help with any of those things, that's my job. So if you want to meet with your member of Congress here, like we will set that up. Um, we're also probably going to be continuing to bring folks, um, including students, to DC to really try to get work done on this and to get something passed by the end of the year. And if you're interested in any of those opportunities, let me know. Um, and you can also be. I mean, it's as much a part of part of advocacy or advocacy as, a, as much an important part of this as it is the cultural awareness part of this. And so making sure that dialogue continues to happen on this campus, that you're lifting up the stories of individuals who are willing to be public um, about their stories and that we're celebrating them and making sure that they have what they need. Um, and that, you know, 
that your university leadership is also speaking up, which I know that the they CUNY are. system is very good at, um, and we appreciate that. But as students, um, sometimes you can say things that your university leadership maybe can't, um, and you can also, if you feel like something needs to be said or needs to be done, you can pressure your university leadership to do that, and I hope that no university leadership in the room hates me for saying that. Um, but that's, that's your role and your prerogative as students. Um, this is, I mean, the place where you're at home for as many years as you're here in your degree. Thank you. Yeah, I would just also add quickly, um, you know, if you know of any uh, undocumented students or, you know, just in general, um, even if you're not undocumented and you need resources, um, there are um, places on campus where you can um, obtain this type of, of resources, not just the clubs, but also like the offices within the school uh, that can assist you uh, in, in, in finding you, especially the financial aid that sometimes is really hard to, to come by. Um, there's also many uh, grassroots organizations. Um, I can think of the New York State Youth Leadership Council. Um, if uh, you know of any undocumented youth that um, wanna be empowered, wanna become organizers as well, I mean, want to get resources and, you know, just find people like who are like-minded and understand uh, the situation. Um, you can send them there too. To add briefly, we do trainings also at Forward um, and a lot of those trainings are directed at students. So if that's something that you want to be a part of, we have a really robust media training program for those people who do want to speak out publicly and share their stories. Um, and that's something that we also engage allies in because allies' voices are very important at this moment, um, especially to showcase how you know integrated and enmeshed these folks are in our communities. So trainings, um, come talk to me afterwards. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that uh, if you feel if you're impassioned enough to be an organizer, that's amazing, and I think Forward uh, is a is a really great place to find the information you need to empower you to be able to do that. Um, it's it's the resource I use to do it myself. Um, but if you don't feel passionate enough, or you're not comfortable being someone that's an organizer, even though we may not feel it all the time, like every single voice matters. And as someone who's gone to Congress to talk. Uh, to senators and, and members of the House who has called my members of Congress on a number of occasions, they answer the phone. Uh, if it's after hours, they listen to the voicemails. Like they really, really, really care. And so even if it's just, you're just one person making one phone call to, uh, to, to the person that represents your district or the people that represent your district, it, it matters. And so, uh, so call. And if you can get one friend or two friends to do it with you, right, or 10 or 20, whatever it is, like every, every single voice matters. Yes. Put your member of Congress in your phone as your favorite, like they're your best friend. You can put emojis <laughs> after their name, and then call them like they're your mom. I assume you all call your moms every day. You should call your member of Congress every day, too. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm not... Thank you. I'm not 100% sure that any of you can actually answer this one, but I'm going to ask it in case it falls in somebody's bucket. Um, Possibly Bryant's. Okay, not meaning to stick you out. Why doesn't, <laughs> so why doesn't, or I guess maybe can't, America produce American-born citizens with currently missing tech education? Where do these foreign-born, technically trained individuals receive their education? You may not be able to answer these, I'm not sure. Um, how, much, how much does it cost these foreign-born individuals out of their own pockets? I have no idea what of all that you can answer, but um, I guess take a stab. Yeah, so um, it all comes down to choice, right? And so we have uh, students that are in high school, they make a choice as to where to go to college, and then they choose what it is they want to study. Um, for someone that works in the tech industry, unfortunately there are not enough Americans that are deciding to study engineering, right? That are deciding to become math majors. Uh, if there were more, then they could fill those jobs. And so uh, that really is the answer, right? And whenever we're talking to people that, that are in high school or in college, right, like there's underemployment in these spaces. So if what you care about is getting a job, getting a high paying job, uh, getting a job with security, one where there's underemployment, as in there are more job openings and there are people to fill the jobs, is going to give you a lot of security. But the reason why there aren't Americans, it's not because we can't crank them out, right? We have enough universities. We have the arguably the best universities on the planet. Uh, it's because we don't have enough American students choosing to study the fields that we need to, that, that American companies need to hire people in. And so 
Uh, that is why, for the same reason before, uh, we need to be finding people that are being trained in other countries or immigrants that are attending American universities and then not telling them to leave after they get educated, which happens all of the time as well and, and happened, happens today, happened long before Trump came into office. And so creating a path uh, to citizenship, creating a path to contribution to our economy and our community is how we become a competitive economy. Um, where these people are, are being trained that are not from uh, the US, there are hundreds, thousands of unbelievable institutions in science, technology, engineering, and math outside of the US. You do not have to be trained here in order to be capable to fill these jobs. Um, you know, I, you can think, you know, I could list off five uh, publicly traded household names, whether it's Google or Yahoo or 25 other ones that uh, are f now famous, considered American businesses that were founded by people that are not from here. Um, I think 50% of the Fortune 500 more were founded by immigrants or children of an immigrant. So you can get a sense of the impact, right? And most of these people are not being educated here. So uh, there are thousands of institutions, and we would, we just don't have the people here. Students just aren't choosing to study. So in order to compete, we need people coming from other places to fill these jobs. Thank you. Um, so there's two kind of along the same line, and one of them says, ask Ali. So I'm asking Ali. Um, but please also <laughs> weigh in, um, everyone. So the issue of immigration was only split in party lines in recent years. In your opinion, why has it become such a controversial topic, and what can we do to promote a ground for dialogue across party lines like we used to in the 1980s? And kind of related, what impact do you feel Trump has had on the modern Republican Party, which is a very big question, but I think maybe we want to answer it specifically um, in terms of our topic tonight. All right. Um, I don't know if you can guess by looking at me, but I was not alive in the 80s. Um, so I don't really know what politics was like then. Um, yeah, so Forward is in a very interesting position as an organization because we are bipartisan and we're, I mean, we've worked really hard and we're really lucky to be taken seriously by both Democrats and Republicans. It's hard for me to pin down some of, I don't know if one of you wants to contribute to this, um, why exactly um, immigration seems to be spit, split along party lines. Um, I think that when we were looking to try to pass immigration reform in 2013, one of the things that it came down to was kind of who gets the credit, um, which I think can be pretty divisive. Um, and there's also talks about like the voting blocks, right? Like how, who, who, who's gonna get the credit for fixing this issue and then get the Latino voting block. Um, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I can't say entirely like what the validity of all of these things, all of those things is, um, but that's kind of where I would start. Um, can you say w what some of the other parts of this question are? Sure. Um, so right, so the I issue of immigration was only split in party lines in recent years. In your opinion, why has it become such a controversial topic? Yeah. What can we do to promote a ground for dialogue across party lines? Mm -hmm. And I think that the position that we're in right now in trying to pass a DREAM Act and just seeing the bipartisan support that has really coalesced around this issue is an incredible starting point. Um, people are talking to each other that, for the most part, like don't usually enter the same room as the other people except for votes on the Senate and House floors. Um, they care about this issue. They're hosting press conferences. Um, we've had more Republicans speaking out and hosting press conferences on this issue than ever before. Um, there was a big one last week with 10 Republicans. There was one today with Congressman Curbelo. Um, and I think that now that we've seen a lot of these people who have previously been silent on this issue kind of, you know, get more acquainted with it, that that's a really great starting point for moving forward. And after we pass a DREAM Act, being able to work to protect the rest of the 11 million undocumented folks in our country and get concrete immigration reforms done. Interestingly enough, it feels like uh, immigration um, has become one of those topics that in recent years have been split within party lines. but. Um, actually, in the 1980s, um, the Republicans used to take a lot of pride um, in being able to defend immigrants. And it was Ronald Reagan who actually um, passed the, the Immigration Act of 1986, IRCA, which allowed uh, millions of people to legalize their status. Um, so because of how the political spectrum has changed throughout the years, um, 
uh, immigration has become one of those topics that became identified with the Democratic Party uh, in recent years um, because it is now the party that we see that represents the immigrants, the, la the Latino community, people of color in general, and so. Uh, but this wasn't the case um, actually in the 1900s, and even in uh, in the first in the first part of of, of the 20th century, um, uh, the Democrats used to be a very uh, conservative party, and the Republicans used to be more um, towards the the liberal side. Uh, well, not liberal, but it's not the same party that we know today. And so uh, it's just it's just a matter of where we're standing. Uh, during this particular time. And unfortunately, immigration being one of those issues that since the beginning of, of U.S. immigration policy uh, has always been um, particularly, um, um, it has always taken a huge spotlight because you know, it's, it's, it's about xenophobia. It's about not knowing the other. And so when we talk about how do we bring these parties together to the same table, I think what, what matters is, is dialogue. You know, and it's funny because <laughs> that's what the center does, uh, sit down and listen to each other because, you know, as an immigrant myself, I feel like what's often missing is, you know, people being able to hear my story, which is why I, I constantly am telling my story to an, anyone I know. That's how you actually bring people to your side when they understand uh, your circumstances and you find common ground. Thank you. It, it, now oh, that I've ahead. had a moment to, sorry, I just want to add one more thing, <laughs> to like reflect a little bit on what I said. I think that I also want to mention that, I, that saying that immigration is split along party lines is also a little bit of a scapegoat. Um, there's actually very broad support for immigration reform. When we're talking about the issue of passing a DREAM Act specifically, 80%, 80, well more than 80% of Americans support that, and it's close to 80% of Republican voters. Um, and when we're talking about immigration reform broadly, I'm pretty sure that it's it's been like close to one in four individuals um, who support that. So, I mean, I think that that part of it falls on us also as constituents to just make sure that that our members of Congress know that this is something that we support and we want to get done, and that it moves to the top of our priority list rather than staying at two or four, which is where it seems to be for a lot of people. So despite their broad support, um, we don't actually get the chance to move forward. Thank you. And think you'll go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll as the token Republican up here, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, so uh, while I'm the oldest on this panel, I definitely don't consider myself old. I'm 34. Uh, and so I've been a member voting, a voting member of the party for a little while. Uh, and the party as it is today is, n is completely unrecognizable to me, even though my experience and my time in, in, uh, in understanding politics in any way, shape, or form is, is, is not long. And so the, the, I guess if what exists today is modern, what I will refer to will be classic uh, Republican uh, view and interests uh, were pro-immigration, and the reason they were pro-immigration is because they're pro-economy, and immigration drives the economy, right? It was low tax, it was unburden the small worker and the small business so that they can innovate and create jobs and get government out of the way. Um, that, that's the, the party I'm familiar with. Why it has morphed into something today that is very different from that, that is uh, anti-immigrant, that is anti-trade, which is really insane to me, right? Like, the Republican parties are the ones driving, like, globalization, opening up of borders and trade between countries because the, the, the science shows that it creates more opportunity for everybody globally, that it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game, which means every time there's a winner, there's also a loser, right? It, it can be a win-win situation. Uh, and now we're not, for reasons that, uh, as to my understanding, my limited understanding, uh, are incorrect, right? Those reasons are, if we stop allowing trade, then we're gonna stop getting the short end of the stick uh, in a trade imbalance, and then there'll be more money here and more jobs here, which doesn't prove out to be true. If we stop allowing uh, immigrant workers to come in, then they're gonna stop 
taking jobs from Americans, and then there will be more jobs for Americans, and all these people that I'm representing in rural counties across America that are disaffected and unemployed and aren't making as much money t today as they were five and ten years ago that are so angry, right? It's like this anger, this burn that, that has really driven a lot of the movement of the Republican Party towards this nationalist, protectionist, anti-trade immigrant um, are for reasons that are promised, right? It's like things they're gonna do that they promise are gonna bring jobs back, right? Bring the coal mines back. That's just not possible, right? It's not gonna happen. There are better, more efficient, more affordable uh, forms of energy, not to mention the fact that like global warming is real. Uh, and so it's like also not good regardless of economic impact. Uh, and, and those things aren't gonna happen. The jobs aren't gonna come back, right? The, uh, the job that this immigrant has taken is not uh, something that there's an American even available to fill most of the time. And so uh, that, that has been at least what I've seen, my like trying to break down the insanity of the last few years, uh, ending us up where we are today with a party that I'm just completely unfamiliar with. All right. Um, last two questions, and I'm asking them together for a reason. They're both a bit provocative, um, so why not end on that note? Um, but also because I think that they represent the range of opinion which is in the room, which I think is exceptionally important, um, and is really, you know, I mean, this is the work that we try to do. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, answer whatever piece of this you feel comfortable answering, okay, all three of you. There's two of them, they're bookends. One says, why is Trump blamed for being against immigrants when he is only against illegal immigrants? That's number one. Number two is, are you considering the racist aspect of the DACA and immigration ban? This is the kind of... Can you the sure. Um, I think what is meant by this is, are you considering the fact that the end of DACA um, and the immigration ban, what you referred to as the Muslim ban, are inherently racist. Like, are, is there, are we considering that? Yes. Um, <laughs> I want to actually answer the first question, though. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted, to <laughs> yeah, I wanted to address the, the first question, which is why is Trump being blamed for being anti-immigrant when he's only against um, illegal immigration? Uh, so we are... Since Trump has taken office, um, the the political s situation has been very unfavorable to immigration broadly, and it's his presidency, and it's the people that he surrounds himself with that has put um, some of those policies forward. And so that includes things like the travel ban, but it also includes things like the introduction of the RAISE Act, which wants to cut immigration by 50%, legal immigration. Um, so that, I mean, that's just the political reality. These are some of the things that are being introduced, the discussions that are happening in our country right now, the legislation that people are trying to put forward. I will say, though, that Trump is also on the record supporting various aspects of immigration. He has said that he wants a solution to this problem um, of the DACA appeal, that he wants legislation that's going to protect dreamers, and that's a good thing. And he has also said, despite the fact that legislation has been introduced that wants to cut immigration by 50%, he has said that he does not want to cut elite illegal immigration. So, I, I mean, there's a lot of nuance, I think, always to the discussions around immigration and the positions that people hold, but I think it's really important to account for the fact that Donald Trump is the President of the United States, um, and largely what he indicates and the people that he surrounds himself with to craft legislation um, is what is gonna, I mean, is what is gonna be perceived um, by the public. Um, and is also the direction that immigration legislation is going to go in. You can go for it if you want. No, I'm still here. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to unpack a lot of that. Um, maybe I'll start with the racist side. Um, to start, and this is something that we uh, spoke about uh, before I came about sort of like the purpose of this organization and the purpose of events like this. So I think like as impassioned as uh, as three panelists that are very engaged on this issue may get, I think the most important thing, especially f in a place like this, right, like a, a center for higher education, is that discourse and, and uh, respecting each other's opinions um, 
and not sort of demonizing somebody because they have a view that isn't uh, the same as yours is really important. And, and it, when issues like this that are really emotionally charged uh, come up, I think it's important to start with something like that. And so I guess for the students in the room, I would say uh, always start with respect for the person you're having a conversation for. If you can come from a place of trying to walk in somebody else's shoes, it'll really open your eyes. Uh, to what their reality may be like, because uh, like it or not, you only walk in your own shoes and you look through your own eyes, and that perspective is radically different from most other people on the planet. And so trying to do that will help you be a better person, it'll help you be a smarter person, it'll help you be better at, uh, at your job, with your friends, with hiring, with everyone from like your boss to your mom. Uh, so, I, and I think that's really important. And so, like when we've, and a lot of people that I, uh, that I work with and, and know in the community in tech in New York have been trying to do a lot of work reaching out to like the other side of the aisle, trying to understand why people that are against something like DACA or uh, against immigration in general or illegal immigration or whatever it is, why they feel that way. Because it's only until you understand that person and why they feel that way that you can really start to try to have an impact on it. Uh, so, is it inherently racist? I think that like I don't really want to jump into like the mind of Donald Trump or uh, anyone else in the White House and like their reasons for uh, for writing certain legislation. Um, I'll I'll maybe focus on like sort of the reasons that are that are stated. Although I'll also say that what Donald Trump says and then what he means and what he does don't always seem to be directly aligned with each other. Um, but whether it was intended or not. I think it's hard to say that taking a specific class of individual and then treating them differently than other classes is is like almost the definition of uh, of of bias of uh, racism. Um, and so I think it's hard, regardless of whether the intent was there, to say that the the Muslim ban band is not because it's trying to equate an entire class of people um, and to paint them with the same brush, uh, even though they're not the same in any way, shape, or form, right? Even to take like all refugees, right? The United States has always prided itself on being the most generous country on the planet. If you look at how much we donate to different causes, both in the US and abroad, we trump the rest of the planet many times over in dollars committed. Uh, and, and that has also translated into support of refugees, right? There, we are the place that refugees come because our borders are open, because we are a land that was built by immigrants, and we know that we're stronger if we're more diversified, and that's the, that, that is what America was built upon, regardless of sort of the, the current climate. Um, and refugees are the most vulnerable people on the planet, right? They're people that if they don't live, if they don't move from where they're currently living, they may die, they may be killed, they may starve, whatever it is. And so to paint all, like even to paint people, like all refugees with the same brush, and to say, we can't let any of them come because then we're gonna have more terrorists here, when there uh, are far more people killed by Americans with guns or American homegrown terrorists with guns than uh, ever by foreign terrorists that have made their way into the country. It again is, it's a, it's, seems to me like a fear thing that's easy to get uh, to, to, to grab onto if you don't actually understand the facts that underlie the issue is we need to stop people that are in ISIS from coming here because they're going to kill lots of people like remember 9-11 and it's like the ban wouldn't have stopped any of the hijackers from 9-11 it wouldn't right and so the argument just doesn't line up the other piece of it was uh, Trump, why is he blamed for being against immigration uh, when he's really just against illegal immigration? So the interesting thing about that question is he is now in a place where he can define what is and what isn't illegal, right? And so you had DACA recipients that were here legally, and in, in a short period of time, they will be here not legally. And so he's, he's not just operating on the lines of what was and wasn't legal when he came into office. He's moving those lines, and he's moving them in a direction that is not favorable to immigrants. And it is also not favorable to people like me that want to employ great immigrants that are going to be creating more jobs and more innovation and having a positive impact on the economy here. And so uh, the policies he's pushed out so far, the one I was talking about regarding H-1Bs, like that is a restriction on legal immigration. And so you can't say that he's only in support 
like where he's only against illegal immigration, he's changing laws to limit immigration and specifically the kinds of immigration that are enabling innovation, job creation, GDP growth, and for us to be able to compete against other countries. Thank you very much. Yeah. I guess what I would say it comes from my experience being an organizer. Um, when, when you organize, you uh, even though I may come off as someone that's uh, on a particular uh, political spectrum, I actually have to be on both sides of the aisle and take a look at, at the way that, that, that folks are thinking around the country, if, especially if I want to be able to empower uh, the community that I'm working with, which in this case is the immigrant community. Um, I do uh, think that, given my experience, um, you know, President Trump is not the first person to be uh, concerned about um, illegal versus legal immigration. Some of the harshest laws that we have in immigration actually came out of the Clinton administration. And the, the first Muslim ban that we had in this country came right after 9-11 during uh, the Bush administration. And during uh, the Obama administration, almost four million people got uh, deported um, and broken apart from their families. And so um, I actually don't find it um, I'm not the type of person that's going to come and be like, oh, yes, Trump, you're doing all of this because we've actually been fighting for so long uh, to make sure that uh, immigrants uh, don't continue to be uh, discriminated against or criminalized. Um, my experience, for example, going into detention centers has um, taught me that sometimes it, it, it can be a, a racial issue because the, the communities that are mostly affected by, by these policies tend to be people of color. Um, and so, you know, you know, whether you agree with me or not, my, it, my experience is based on what I've seen on the ground. The way uh, the families are separated, uh, uh, those who are, for example, um, in the intersection of these issues, who are, for example, Muslim and black and immigrant, who are also the most um, affected by, <coughs> excuse me, policies in this country. Um, and so um, it's a little bit of history and politics that you have to take into account when you uh, when, I can, when, when you want to answer these type of questions. Thank you. Um, so we're moving on to the dinner and walkabout portion um, of the evening. But before we do, I really want to thank all three of our panelists, um, Francis, Ali, and Brian, um, for, for an incredible amount of combined knowledge and also grace and resilience. Thank you. Yeah.